still have yet to see one of those on campus. I guess we have lots of people on scooters these days, motorized scooters, motorized skateboards, but not uh, jetpacks. Uh, I guess it doesn't need to be. Perhaps I'd uh, Actors Sterling Hayden and Alan Arkin and Leonard Nimoy and James Conn and Struther Martin, Nancy Pelosi, Tennessee Williams, and Captain Kirk, and Bob Elliott of Bob and Ray, who since his last birthday has had the pleasure of seeing his granddaughter hit the big leagues of comedy on the cast of Saturday Night Live in the same building in which he hit the big leagues in 1951. Happy birthday, Bob. Let's play oddball. We begin at the Salto Bale Falls in Brazil, where this fellow took the express elevator to the basement via kayak. <laughs> Pedro Olivia, row, row, rowed his boat a record 127 feet to the bottom of the falls and amazingly survived without a scratch. The drop took exactly three seconds. It breaks the old record there by about 20 feet. And while it looks like they might have just chucked a dummy over the falls, like in the movie The Fugitive, the stuntman and his friend appeared on the Today Show this morning to verify the story. Mr. Olivier then uh, kayaked off the Prometheus statue into the ice skating rink at Rockefeller Center. <laughs> More stunt activity, this kind on un, 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 unintentional or non-intentional. Yeah, Some crazy people around. Uh, this is germane to what we'll talk about today as well. I'll put the volume on. Interesting, it doesn't want to move. I don't know, still don't know why the volume doesn't play to you. I can hear it. The video will hear it. So, kind of seems to think. I guess it's real, right? Not uh, done with smoke and mirrors. That's kind of interesting. And finally, just so you see the relevance related to fluids, <coughs> the same deal but with fluids instead. So it says something about what we will do today. And I guess I'll play it. Why not? <coughs> they sent anyone actually down there but I guess I get you get the idea that um, the, the similarity between this maybe I guess they don't have someone going down there but you know what their intent is to be able to shoot someone down there I'm not sure what the holes are for to be able to fish someone out if they get stuck I suppose So essentially, um, the behaviors that you'd expect for this are no different than uh, what you'd expect in this. So it happens to be, we've made the point on a number of occasions that if you're dropping an apple or dropping a beaker of water or dropping water outside of a beaker, then fluids and solids uh, really uh, aren't very different from each other. They all certainly obey uh, Newton's law. Uh, Newton's second law, F equals MA, which is the main recourse that we have in this class. Uh, and so this car going around the circuit, the loop-the-loop -loop circuit, is no different from trying to send someone around uh, in water, where they're ca being carried with the water in the, in the previous, uh, previous video. And so that's kind of the topic uh, that we'll talk about today. And that is, uh, we dealt with Bernoulli um, 
along a streamline. And of course, this car is traveling along a streamline. But the reason that it is held with traction on the wheels as it goes upside down is because of uh, centripetal force. And so we talked last time about looking along a streamline. We defined Bernoulli for that between points one and two. And we did a couple of examples to examine that. But we also said that you can go across streamlines. And if you go across streamlines, you can write a Bernoulli equation as well to be able to describe that behavior. So that's exactly what we'll attempt uh, to do today. Any questions before we get going on um, Monday's test? Um, I, I neglected to say in the email um, and also in class that uh, the numerical answers have a, a plus minus of 10% on, on, on Canvas. So there's a fair latitude. I guess last year we started off with a smaller margin and maybe after a couple of tests it went to 10. I think that's about the right number. It means you probably can't guess them. Um, uh, but you can have a, there's a fair bit of error um, thrown into your calculations. So, so anyway, that's, that's the one thing I, I would mention. I'm going to be here on Monday. If you want to join me, fine. If you want to do it in the comfort of your apartment, that's fine too. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Well, let's get rolling. Let's do as we normally do. And look at behavior. Well, what did we do last time? Um, we uh, essentially looked at um, Bernoulli along a streamline. You recall that uh, we had this figure that I drew that was kind of an airfoil, looks like a whale there. And uh, we drew on that some streamlines. That would be the paths that individual particles take as they go downstream. And we defined two conditions. One was that we could write between here and here, for instance, if we wanted to define behaviors at these two points. And of course, our interest is in being able to define this expression. Typically, this um, integral here, I guess I always prefer to write it slightly differently. I divide through by g and g and g, in which case um, it's all written in terms of um, uh, lengths. This integral, if its uh, pressures don't change a lot, this integral just becomes p, and we don't have to worry about that. If you're dealing with compressible fluids, which we said that Bernoulli doesn't really account for, you can account for it with this. I don't think we'll do any examples uh, with, with that. And so it allows you to be able to write this equation for three uh, points here, a velocity, a velocity, a elevation, and a pressure. And likewise, solve for three points here, or no, no three points. And you hope that out of these six variables, you have five of them, and you can solve for the other one. So last time, we knew velocity, elevation, and pressure for the jet engine. We knew uh, velocity was zero for the stagnation point, uh, elevation, but not pressure for the where it hit the, uh, the truck. And we could solve for this last variable. And so that was our attempt to be able to define that. And of course, this expression here, as we said many times, is equal to this. And the individual components that mark that, I probably don't need to say this all the time, forces are this term and this term, and accelerations are the v squared term. Kinetic energy, half v squared and half mv squared is kinetic energy. And it's, in this case, it's equal to rate of change of momentum. So acceleration is uh, rate of change of velocity. Velocity times mass is momentum, and it's rate of change of that. And so this v squared term represents that. And so 
what we'll do today is we'll look at the counter to this behavior, and that is that all these uh, expressions that we had before were the streamlined velocity. And so this streamlined velocity was the velocity in the direction of the streamline. What we'll look at now is what happens if you go normal to that streamline. And we will write, do some expressions with a, a point 0.3, if you can see that, and a point 0.4. And the question is, how do we go, what, how do pressures vary as you go across streamlines? And so the example of that was these loop-the-loop -loop things that we just looked at for the car and also for the, um, for the fluids. And the corollary of, of that in our particular example, when we did it with the video last time, is that we said the expression for rotational behavior is F equals M A, um, where this is angular acceleration, and this is radial force. And so if you look at the behavior that we would have, if you have something which is being thrown around at some particular speed, then you could imagine that this is moving in this direction at a velocity theta. And we can rewrite this acceleration term as mass times v squared over r as a standard result. You, we checked last time whether this has the units of acceleration. Length squared over time, sorry, length over time squared divided by um, length gives you length over meters per second squared. And so the behavior of this is such that if you look at defining this, this weight is equal to mg. This force up here is m v theta squared over r. And so to be able to balance these, these must be <coughs> balanced somehow. So they must be equal to each other. And so we know that this is an m, by the way. mg has to be equal to at least v theta squared uh, over r times m. We could divide this through by vol volume if we wanted to on both sides. And then if we do that, then this becomes density density of a fluid in each case, mass divided by volume. And so this is just saying that to be able to counter gravity as you go around this, you have to go at a velocity which is equal to this. So you know what gravity is. Uh, you can define r by the, um, by the length of your, um, by, the, by the circuit, I guess it would, it would make a circle out of this. This would be this would be r, lowercase r. And so it says that as the um, r becomes smaller and smaller, you need less velocity to go around, which is kind of what you feel, right? If you, there's a big arc, you could imagine you have to go very quickly. You know that if you pull the rotating cup in on the string, you know that it's for the same rotation speed, same speed that it actually goes. So it's not a rotation speed. It's, this is actually the speed the velocity that's it's going around this contour, v theta. So this is the speed, so it'd be a meters per second. You know that as you pull it in, you'd have to apply more force to be able to keep it in. So that's the expression that would tell you that if you go below this velocity, you'll drop out and the water will drop out with you as you go through the, the, the top of the, of the circle. So that's our interest in doing this. So what we'll try and do is we'll end up with the corollary of these two equations. This, you'll note that this equation is Bernoulli that equals zero. This is the integrated form of Bernoulli where you integrate it and it becomes a constant. So this is the more convenient one for us to use. And in the same way as we go across streamlines, this is the um, raw version, similar to equal to zero. And this is the version where we integrate it and it's equal to um, a constant. In this case, normal to a streamline instead of being along a streamline. Although the velocities, obviously, not obviously, the velocities are the along streamline velocities because the velocity normal to the streamline is zero, right? The only velocity is, uh, the, the flow is parallel to the streamline or in the streamline, so the velocity normal to that has to be 
by definition zero. So let's look at, at, at that expression. So let's spend some time thinking about what these expressions. So ultimately, you'll end up using this expression here. It's the only one that we have to worry about. I know I'm overwriting what I've just written, but this is the expression that ultimately we'll want to use and we'll use today. But where does that come from? So you remember last time that we talked about some kind of lever arm? Uh, some kind of arc attached to this. I don't know how good my arc is. They should be the same lengths. This is a radius. This is radius outwards. This is what we'll call a normal direction pointing inwards towards the center of the circle. This is where r is equal to zero. And this is where, obviously, uh, lowercase r, lowercase r is equal to r. Um, we have a fluid moving along here, and it moves at some velocity directly at that place here. Uh, didn't get any closer, but you see it's, I want it to be exactly at this point. Okay. This magnitude here is theta. This magnitude here is also theta. So look at it. And this has a streamlined velocity, which we'll also think of as, as v theta. So these are equivalent to each other. So what we can do is we can write the fact that v theta is equal to the streamlined velocity, which is equal to the radius it's turning through multiplied by its uh, rate. So this is in radians a sec. So we have that. We can square those. So we get v theta squared is equal to vs squared, which equals r squared omega squared. And then what we can do is we can borrow an expression we already have. Let's see if I can transport it here. Uh, we talked about it in 4.1. So sorry for the here. Somewhere this equation here. And so if we take this and be able to remove it, I don't know if I can, if this works, let's see if it works. Am I trying to be too clever? D piece, there it equals rho. Anyway, so we use that expression. Let's see if it does translate to where, we wa where I want it. A bit cumbersome. didn't, so that's fine. I'll write it in. So the expression is dp dr minus rho omega squared r equals zero. So that's the expression we have. And so what can we do with, uh, with that? We could multiply both sides by dr. And we could integrate them. dr over dr is 1. And so we have the integral dp minus the integral rho omega squared r dr. Um, we could divide both sides through by rho g. Has to equal zero, of course. And uh, we can simplify it. So the integral of this is going to be pressure divided by unit weight minus the terms here. This term here, we could also 
multiplied through by, uh, we have this term r squared omega squared, so we could multiply this term by uh, r squared over r. And so this term then becomes this. So it becomes minus, we get rid of this, I guess we get rid of this and this. We end up with v theta squared over gr. dr equals zero. Don't need that. And I guess this this now becomes, since we've done the the integration, uh, this now has become a, uh, a constant. Rather than a zero. So this is a constant. And so we have an expression then which kind of looks a bit like what we had before. If, if I write it out with uh, f equals ma, it would look something like this. So f minus ma theta equals zero is what we had before. So this is the angular acceleration term. It's in a horizontal plane. So remember when we developed those equations, we were spinning around the z-axis, which was vertical. So we don't have a component which accounts for the change in pressure as we go elevation, with elevation. And so what we have to do is maybe just include that final term. And that final term ends up being pressure divided by unit weight um, plus elevation plus integral v theta squared over g. It's over lowercase r, but let's replace that with this radius here, just for convenience. And let's replace this dr for the normal pointing into the rotation center. So this would be dn, and this would be dr, a small amount. And so dn is equal to minus dr, because they're vector quantities in the opposite direction. And so if we exchange this out for minus dn, and this becomes dn, then this sign changes here, which is what is here, and this is equal to constant. So a bit laborious, but the point is that this is the expression, final expression that we have at the top of the page that we will then use. And is the final form of that relationship. So it looks a bit like Bernoulli before. So this should be exactly the same as, as this equation here. I guess this was just written. These are swapped with each other. But this is basically the same equation. Looks a bit like Bernoulli. It has the two parts on the left-hand side which relate to the force. It has the one part here which relates to the acceleration. and that these equal zero are constant. Don't We're going to equate them to each other because we've integrated it. And so we can use this in exactly the same way as we've used before to be able to solve expressions. And we've just avoided doing all of this, which is great. And so we could apply this in this kind of format to be able to look at the behavior as you go across the top of an airfoil or a bump in the road. And so to bring us back to what we know about life, we know that when um, you go across a, a bump, in the, when you go into a dip, you're pushed into your seat. And as you go across the crest of a hill quickly, you come out of your seat. And so the, the water is seeing exactly that same behavior. And so we can evaluate what those behaviors are just by looking at, at this particular geometry. And so the easiest way to do that is to take this expression and uh, maybe write it out here as to what the behavior would be. So the idea is that we can go across between points one and two. This is in the z direction, uh, but pointing downwards is in the n direction, remember? So if we go back to our geometry that we had before, we made this point that the n direction always points in towards the curvature. 
And so that's our, our way of providing a reference to this. And so if we define that behavior, then we can merely write Bernoulli at two different locations in this. And so according to this expression up here, it would be um, either way. So what are we going to want to know? We're going to want to know P1, I suppose. So let's start off with uh, P1. It doesn't matter which order we write them in. P1 um, plus gamma Z1 plus rho V squared over R integrated dn. And that has to be equal to P2 plus the unit weight times Z2 plus rho integral P squared over R dn again. Density is going to be the same. Uh, we've chosen to write this in terms of R. Let's choose some point of the radius. Obviously, if this is horizontal in this particular case, then if we try and draw the streamlines, uh, actually, let me, let me draw it at some intermediate point. So we're writing some velocity v theta here. The radii for this, if it's a straight line, this radius here is going to be infinity, right? And so not so much important that it's infinity. Obviously, these terms will disappear because it's infinity. But I guess more importantly, since they are equal to each other, they will just uh, cancel out. So you can think of it either way. Either these terms both go to 0, and they also cancel out as 0. It's uh, either, either way you want to think of it. And you're left with the other terms. And so the other terms would give you the fact that pressure 1 is equal to pressure 2 plus uh, the unit weight of the fluid times Z2 minus Z1. Oops, not Z1 which should be pretty familiar and quite apparent to you, right? And so what this is saying, Z2 is higher up, Z1, so this is positive. This, is, this term here is basically what we've called before H, right? Just the H. And so we know that this behavior, although this is getting to be a busy figure, and I should choose some other colors, the behavior is just this. We alluded to this before. The pressure distribution within the fluid is just linear. And this linear behavior is just given by the unit weight, just as if you were in a swimming pool. And the reason for that is that even though it's flowing at speed, it's not static anymore. It's not moving relative to each other. So it could just as well be in a container, right? A container that is moving at some rate to the right. It's not accelerating because it's going at some constant speed. Uh, and even if it was, it's not accelerating in the vertical direction, and so the pressure distribution you could rationalize should be exactly that. So that's the, the deal. I guess the two things that we've done, or a couple of things, is that this is really the velocity at point one, and this is the velocity at point two. They're the same. This should really be, you remember before, that we converted this r from a, a value of lowercase r, which was just the radius of those points. So I suppose you could make the point that r 1 and R2 are different, but it just over, overly complicates it. So we take this as being some medium point in between them, and this would be exactly R here. It doesn't matter in this case because R is equal to infinity. So that's the one way of, of doing it. The second way of doing it is to uh, do it for this location here. And so I could, uh, yeah, maybe it's worthwhile. If you look in the notes below this, it's actually written out for you. But I'll just do it here. Oh. And that is that if you write it out again, so we could do it again. So it would be from this equation at the top. The pressure at point 4, I guess I should have said before, obviously, the pressure at point 2 is 0, right? It's atmospheric. and So, we, so the pressure at point 4, I'll write it around the way that I want which is plus the unit weight of fluid times Z4 plus density times the integral V squared over <coughs> R dn. And that 
is equal to P3, which we'd like to know probably, plus the unit weight Z3 plus rho V squared over R dm. And so we could, I guess this is an integral in here as well. So these integrals are between, we could think of it as an integral between the middle location. So I now have to draw this, I suppose. So if I do this and I do this, this now becomes radius r. Let's take a point between them, which that r comes to. So an intermediate point between 3 and 4 uh, that is between them. Let's assume that the velocity v4 and the velocity v3 are roughly the same. The streamlined velocities along that streamline. And so we can rewrite this in some form. And it's going to be the fact that, I suppose uh, we wrote it this way, we're going to probably want to know what p3 is. So it is going to be p3 is equal to P4 um, plus the unit weight of Z4 minus Z3. So I've taken out this term, this term, this term. And we'll have an extra term on the base of it. And so these integrals would be between um, 0, to um, R3 and 0 to R4, right? This is, these are these different locations here. So this is a, a constant that we're going to assume, but this integral is bet between these two locations. And of course, um, if you think of an integral of any function between two points, if this is R, and this is some function, and the function looks like this, and this, for instance, is R3, and this is R4, then the integral dr0 to R4 minus the integral 0 to R3 is equal to the integral between those limits. In other words, it's saying that this volume, this area here for this first integral, minus the volume for the second integral, which is this. If you subtract one from the other, you end up with this <coughs> remaining part here. So, so on that. So we could write this out as being equal to, um, if we're on the right side, so we've taken P3, so it would be plus the integral between of density V squared over R times dN, which is between R3 and R4. This is dN. And we can write this dn as dn equals minus dr. So we can exchange this term here. And this becomes a negative term. So if I substitute this, then this dn becomes minus dr. And I'm just going to exchange it myself. And we have the expression that defines that behavior. So it's written down below. Maybe it's a bit clearer down below. Uh, so you see that exact expression here. So this is uh, that same expression. R and Z are obviously in the same direction, right? So Z is vertically upwards, and R is as well. So this is R and this is z, the, the n direction is vertically downwards. But this expression, this is the difference between the elevation of this point and this point. So this is saying that this is this linear distribution 
which already is getting very busy here and you can't see it, but this term here obviously, this term here says that the pressure distribution as you go from one to the other is just a linear distribution of pressure which is given by the hydrostatic even though you're going across a hump and importantly this term here says that it's reduced by some amount because of that and so as you go down here so this what the expression is saying is that the pressure point three is equal to P4 which is zero so you lose that the unit weight times the depth below the surface which is just as if you're in a swimming pool but it's minus this amount here which is equivalent to the velocity squared and the radius. So we made this analog analogy before that if you want to stick to the top of the curve as you're going around it, just by looking at Newton's second law, that the velocity you have to be going at to be able to stick to the crest is equal to v squared over theta times r to be able to counter gravity. And this is basically saying the same thing, is that the amount that gravity is reduced in going over this hump in this particular case is by an amount v squared over theta. This integration here is just a length, right? So this, the integral z4 minus z3 of dz, what would that be? Integral z4, z3, dz is just equal to what we've called h uh, 4 minus 3. Four minus three. So this four minus three is just the difference between these two elevations. So pretty straightforward. So that's just a, a constant, which is a length uh, as it comes out, and it's just multiplied by this velocity, a radius, which we assumed is the same between points three and four, and is uh, gives us a, a reduction. So in other words, what it's saying is that if you're going over a, a bump, don't know where I can draw it. If you're going over a hump that looks like this, then the pressure that you'd see as you go across the streamline, how can I do it? So the pressure that you'd see as you go across, can you draw it in terms of this? If it was static, it would look like P equals minus Z <coughs> unit weight, starting with this. So this is our normal distribution, just like being in a swimming pool. If you're going horizontally, if you're going over a bump like this, then what it would mean that this is reduced because it's a negative sign. So in other words, the distribution would be reduced some amount. And if you're going over a bump, which is going into a trough and coming out the other side, then you'd expect it to look like this because this term here would change into a positive because the radius would be defined here, right? And this would be the normal looking into the radius and the normal would be aligned in the r and the z direction. Here, if you're going across the top of the hump in green, um, then the normal is pointing into the middle of the radius, right? This is the radius. Uh, it's in the opposite direction from from Z and so in this particular case R and N would be in the, the direction pointing in and so it would, it would merely change the sign on this so that's it and so you can look through this it's gone through in longhand here and, and that point is exactly made so you can do that at your leisure and see exactly how it works but that's basically the idea so I think it's kind of cool that it, it describes the behaviors you'd expect in centripetal force so what else? Yeah, so, that's it. so hopefully that's straightforward. Um, we talked about this last time, so I don't know. What we, we talked about stagnation last time. We can go through some examples. We have uh, 20 minutes or so, or 15 minutes to be able to do that. Um, to be able to, I guess there are just a couple of examples in this question. I won't go through the third. Um, we said that Bernoulli applies for a number of circumstances. It has to be inviscid, so the viscosity has to be zero. It has to be incompressible, not a gas, although we can use it for a gas. Uh, it has to not have vortices in it. And importantly, it has to be steady. So in other words, if you look at the picture, um, 
at one moment, and you look at it 10 minutes later, it has to be exactly the same um, velocity field that you're looking at. And so this one kind of draws on that question because it's obviously not steady. So the idea is that you have a bird that is um, diving into the water. And of course, that bird is migrating with location with time. Can I do this? Will it do it? It doesn't do it? Well, fine. I guess I can move it. So it's migrating with time to go into the water. And so by definition, the velocities in that picture, if you take a picture, are changing as a function of time. So what you can do instead is you attach your reference frame to the bird and you look at the velocities relative to the bird and of course the velocity here is steady state if it's air that's coming past it if it's in the water and it's swimming diving into the water then it's water that's coming past it but it's all relative to this particular structure so you have to choose your reference frame to be able to do that and if you do that straightforwardly um, you can write <coughs> Bernoulli's equation for that P V over gamma plus z plus v squared over 2g equals constant. So you can write it in terms of that. The only thing that's changing is that you can think of yourself as ignoring these two other components because they don't really matter. Pressures will be small relative to the dynamic pressure and the changes in elevation will be small relative to that as well. So you can write that at point 1 and point 2 when it's below the water. The question is, what is the pressure that develops at the beak of the bird relative to the other case? And so it would just be equating that velocity air squared over 2g is equal to velocity water squared over 2g. Uh, what swimming velocity under will produce dynamic pressure equal to that when it flies in the air at 40 miles an hour. And so uh, you want to solve for the dynamic pressure in the water. So the question is, what is Vw? And so these two Okay, I guess you have to I guess you have to allow for the fact that you have a unit weight in there as well. So you'd have to multiply through by uh, rho g. If you multiply both sides by rho g, rho g, rho g, which you can do. G doesn't change from location to location, but density of air and the density of water will change. And so you can just rearrange that in terms of uh, what's the velocity squared. So Vw squared is equal to Va squared and the density of air divided by the density of water. And so you know that this term here, whoops, is roughly one over a thousand, right? And so you can solve for the value of velocity in water that you need to be able to do that. And so because the, the water density is uh, large, you don't have to go very fast to be able to build up the same pressure because you're pushing it out, out of the way. So relatively straightforward. Uh, I guess related to the, if you're in for the beginning of the class, we looked at someone going off um, the top of a falls in uh, Brazil, I think. I remember being in... Uh, Ontario when someone, Jesse Sharp, look him up on the internet, uh, took himself off Niagara Falls, about the same height by the looks at it, uh, of these falls in um, Brazil, uh, and was never seen again. I guess his kayak was found, but I'm not sure that he was ever found, so I guess he didn't quite make it, although the guy in Brazil apparently did. And so this is a question, if you fall off Niagara Falls in the barrel, which many people have done, you know the height, uh, if you know the velocity that you're going at the top, the viscous effects are neglected. In other words, viscosity is equal to zero. Code for you can apply Bernoulli to that equation. At what velocity do you strike the rocks or the water at the bottom uh, of the system? 
And so again, you just need to be able to figure out what the question's asking. You're moving at some speed here. You want to know what the velocity is. So clearly when you hit this, the bottom at the stagnation point, the velocity is zero. So that's not going to be any use to you. So you want to do something immediately above that. As you go from point two to point three, you'll change your velocity, your kinetic energy, into pressure energy to build up as a, as a stagnation point. This has a velocity v2, which you can determine. v3, but just by this geometry, is equal to zero. p2, by definition, will be equal to zero. And p3 will be equal to, we don't know what. So here, if you're sitting on the top, what are the conditions? The pressure is atmospheric. The velocity is not zero. It's eight feet a second. And uh, the, the elevation is H, 167 feet or so. And so you can write the equations in terms of that. And so, uh, yeah, you're asked to do it for Niagara Falls and Yosemite Falls, are they 1,430 feet? I guess they are. That's off half done, I guess, is it? I'm not sure. And so you can uh, write the expression in terms of this. We know the pressure is zero. We know the velocity is eight feet a second. We know the elevation is 100 and some, 167 feet. We know the pressure is zero. We know the elevation is zero. H is always, Z is always positive upwards. And so we can solve for this and determine exactly what that is. And if we do that, we end up with a velocity, which is 104 feet a second. If we go a millimeter, an inch further down than this, when our velocity, which we have here, all gets converted, the kinetic energy into a pressure, then we can also calculate what the pressure is as well, just by using, exchanging in this other side. We assume that the velocity is equal to zero, and the pressure is unknown. Same equation, but just by switching it around. I guess that's what this equation is here. So these terms would be the same as above, but the difference here would be that this velocity would be equal to zero, and this pressure would be the unknown. So these are the, the two different components. So identical equations written an inch apart from each other and just allows you to be able to get the velocity or the pressure that's developed as a result of it. You can do it for 167 feet, you can do it for 1430 feet, and uh, presumably you'll find the velocity is larger for the taller one, not surprisingly, um, and presumably you'll find that the pressure is larger for the taller one, which is the bottom one here, and so not, not surprising. And I won't do that, so that, that's it, so Bernoulli. So to recap, the basic idea is that you need to be able to write the behavior at two individual <coughs> locations. Um, you don't need to understand the derivation, but you need to maybe understand how to use um, the expressions. Uh, and they just are these two expressions that we defined earlier. They can be written in two different forms, one of which is equal to zero. By far the most usual form is the integrated form, when it's equal to a constant in each case. I usually use the one where it's divided through by uh, rho g, just because it's easier. Or a gamma, so it's just equal to 1. And all the units are in length, but you can use whatever you choose to, to be able to use. That's it. So that's it. Five minutes early. Must be a record. Any questions for today or any questions for um, the following week? The, uh, I guess the, the homework was due on Thursday. This week's homework is now live. It's on Bernoulli and the stuff of this week. It will be due not until Sunday because next week is a, the, the three days are, are the test. Um, the classes next week are online asynchronously. Um, they, the first one on Monday will close the following Monday at midnight. The one on Wednesday will close, uh, I guess, also on, on Monday at midnight, two periods later. And then the third one on Friday will close on Wednesday, as it is for, for those people, for the times that we've done these things online. Uh, and as I said earlier, uh, 
I'll be in here on Monday if you wish to join me. Don't feel pressure to do that, but you're welcome to join me. No, well, it's open book and open notes. So if you if you need, um, for instance, moment of inertia figures for pressures, you probably need to have those at hand. Okay. I didn't include them. So good question. And I did mention before that the the, the right answers on Canvas are plus or minus ten percent. So you've got a fair latitude to get them right. You have two attempts. It's not really two attempts for you to be able to figure out what the right and wrong answers are. It's really if you make a mistake. I think, uh, like the practice exam, it probably gives you a total score, but it doesn't tell you which, exam, which questions you got right or wrong if you press the button. You're welcome to use the full two attempts. If you screw up and use the full two attempts before the end of the test, or you miss the, the um, submission deadline, take a screenshot of your answers or send your answers in an email in the next five minutes and that'll be fine. And surprisingly, this year I've had no extra time quiet location requests for anybody. And so that's unusual. So. Anything else before we go?